Well, um, I want to start off by a huge thank you to Richard because he's put a lot of work in the videoing process and to Kathy Choate who kind of put the fire underneath uh, both of us for the whole thing. She uh, She's the one who came out and saw my gardens and was like, we need to do this. And so she was kind of the spearhead on that. But um, I also want to preface everything I say with I'm still an amateur and novice in all of this, so uh, I'm still learning, and uh, it's a learning process, as with every garden, uh, gardener knows uh, that you, you win some, you lose some, <laughs> and this has been a really fun adventure, uh, learning to do back to Eden gardening style. Um, we moved here, um, well, we bought our property in 2014, and we began uh, uh, trying to build our place out there and it's completely never been inhabited before so it was dense dense woods as you can only imagine out here with the yopon and everything else um, and so uh, it took us a while to get to the point where we could actually put in the garden but uh, we had to use a backhoe we'll show pictures of that just to clear out the space for my biggest garden because uh, the yopon had you know was so entrenched in if you don't pull all those roots out, you're going to be forever battling them. So we uh, we did do some big unearthing to get that all ready. But when I had my garden plot ready, then we were like, okay, now what do we do? And I did some research, and this is what we decided to try, and it has been a huge success. So um, with that, um, the uh, hopefully keep track of all this, um, and also a huge support. To all of this has been my husband who's been the labor to everything because there's no way I could have done uh, as much as we've done without his without his uh, support. So this is also known as lasagna style uh, sheet layering or composting, no dig, no till garden. It, that Eden style garden has a multitude of names. They all basically have the same concept of how you garden and um, also, uh, just as a side note, we've done this on a pretty big scale, but you can do this same thing on a, a small scale. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, as big as our gardens are. Um, you can use the same principles in a small container or even a pot. Um, it really doesn't matter because it's the process of getting those nutrients to layer in there, which would bring about the healthy soil. <coughs> so this is basically what you're you're doing is you are you are making soil and i had somebody tell me that it's not dirt it's soil because dirt has no nutrients and no no properties to give you life where soil contains living things which help everything to grow and to flourish and so what we're basically doing with this style of gardening is learning how to make living soil and um i read this where someone said if you feed the soil not the plant will produce healthy plants and so that's kind of what we're doing is we're learning how to feed the soil to do this you can look at nature and see how nature itself actually gives us a great example you can look in the fields and the forests where no man has disturbed it and you've got the natural decomposing layers of all the things that fall onto the ground and the animals that leave their residue behind and so forth and all of that contributes to the healthiness of the uh, the things in nature and so that's really what we're trying to mimic um, this is basically sustainable permaculture which is the conserving of an ecological balance by avoiding depletion of natural resources. And that's really the key, is one of the things that I've done through some of the research that I've done with all this, is so much of the gardening styles in the past, and particularly on the big mass gardening, uh, the big, big you know, industry farmers, they're doing more to deplete the soil than they are to replenish it, and therefore, the food does not have the same nutrients that it used to have years ago because the ground doesn't. Um, and this is a development of an agricultural system or method intended to be sustainable and self-sufficient, which I think sounds like something I'm very interested in. And so you see in the regenerative type uh, gardening, which is what I'm, I'm looking to do, you are actually putting nutrients CO2 and H2O back into the ground by not tilling 
and bringing out things that would disturb the ground. Whereas on a big scale, the big farmers, um, when they till, CO2 and H2O get evaporated out of the ground, and so nutrients are deplenished. And it's left the ground in a barren state where it doesn't have the chance to replenish, and that's why it gets hard or so forth. And so it's really critical that you know we learn to um, work with nature and work with what's best for creating an atmosphere for things to grow. Um, it's said that around one-third of the world's topsoil is already degraded, and they, they are estimating that within 60 years it will be completely degraded if we don't change. So it's really important, and it's becoming a, a big thing with people who, particularly young farmers who are jumping into this, it's been really interesting. I have a, a young girl that I hooked up with who has recently inherited a large farm out in Hempstead, and it was her grandmother's, and she's determined to do regenerative uh, farming with her cows and her gardens and everything that she does in order to replenish because when she had the soil tested, it was so depleted that, you know, you can throw a bunch of chemicals in it, but as we all know, that's not really the healthiest thing to do. And a lot of plants don't always absorb the chemicals that can be thrown into the soil. Um, and soil is naturally full of microbes. This was interesting. One teaspoon contains more than all the humans on the earth, which I thought was pretty interesting. <laughs> um, now, to be clear, cultivating the soil is fine. We're not talking about not doing some cultivating of your soil. We're talking about not tilling so far down that you're destroying the natural layers and that you are leaving the soil uncovered. So one of the main thrusts of Back to Eden style gardening is to cover your ground and keep it either with wood chips or with a cover crop which replenishes the ground instead of it just sitting there without any kind of covering on it. But cultivating the soil is actually very good. Um, this, this practice is really basically removing weeds from the garden and loosening the soil. You really don't want to go any more than two inches though because if you go below that then you're starting to disrupt the process of what happens naturally. Um, now I will say that when I harvest potatoes and things like that that are root crop, you, you frequently do go sometimes a little deeper than that. My sweet potatoes sometimes are, you know, deeper down than a couple inches. So uh, again, that's, that's part of that process. But whenever possible, you try not to go beyond a couple of inches. The key is to remember not to disturb the soil as little as possible, growing as many different species of plants as practical, and keeping living plants or soil on top of it uh, and covered at all times, like I said, with the wood chips. Like, this all helps to just replenish the ground and give your ground a good, healthy growing medium to then bring about a healthy crop. Um, regenerative agriculture seeks to mimic nature, not to dominate it. And so um, that's why I have really loved the way this has done. This is a, there's two different pictures here, but I like this one because of the layering. So you start off here with your newspaper, but I, I actually used cardboard. But in a small, a uh, small area you could just use newspaper. We'll talk about these specifics here a little bit more, but then you bring in your compost, your wood chips, and your manure. This is a real quick picture of the basics of what goes into the Back to Eden gardening style. This next picture gives a little bit uh, more information as, as well. So you have, now, you can, uh, we actually took our, like I said, our big garden where I started this and dug down because we had to pull out the yopon and everything that was there that was invasive, which is important. If you've got very, very strong invasive plants, those need to be removed before you start this. But if you are starting on a ground that has not got horribly invasive plants, you can just simply lay the cardboard or the newspaper directly onto the ground and begin to build up from that. Many people have done it that way. Um, just because of where we live, that's not how we've done it. But aside from that, 
everything else has been the same for us. So you start with your ground or your dirt, and then you bring in your paper product, cardboard, newspaper, then you soak all these. Every time you see this little blue layer here, that's, you have to add water to every single layer if you're assembling this. And so you soak this layer very, very thoroughly, and then you bring in your browns and your greens and your wood chips in the varying layers, again, putting water in between. So we'll talk more specifically about this. So on your ground, um, it's suggested that you find a site that gets at least six hours of, of sunlight a day. Um, it's also beneficial if you have um, your garden in a situation so that uh, the sun tracks go across the garden east to west. So your rows should be facing north to south if possible. Um, that way it gets the most sun exposure um, that you can have. And again, I mentioned here that uh, we had to dig out some of our invasive plants. But they, they typically say that you can just cut your grass to one inch of height with your mower and put the, uh, the next layer right on top of the grass if you want to. This shows a picture of a, of a raised bed, but you can kind of make your choice on that. Then you bring in the newspaper and cardboard. And the only thing on this I would say, um, I found the thick cardboard works best just, just to be a nice, good, barrier between anything that might try to come up. So when we did ours, we'd recently moved and we had saved all of our moving boxes and so I pulled them all out of the attic and put them on the, on the ground and they were fabulous. Um, so, but you can use newspaper as well. I would layer it quite a bit. Um, don't do it on a windy day. You might have trouble, but um, <laughs> they also say not to use anything that has um, a slick or magazine you know, texture, color, paper. You really want to steer away from that. And some people even say you shouldn't use newspaper just because that does have ink in that that could be an issue. But by the time you put all the layers on it and everything's going down, I'm not sure it's really going to be an issue for your plants above it. But that's that's some of the some of the uh, other tips that I have read about using newspaper, which, like I said, we've used cardboard. So. Um, so here you can see a picture of my husband uh, adjusting the cardboard. As I said, we had dug down. Now, um, the hill, our, our big garden is actually on a very slight slant, um, which is actually really great. We uh, have like the wonderful sugar sand that I'm sure most of you have as well, which doesn't have much nutrients, but it's great for soil drainage, so that's nice. But um, my husband actually dug little troughs every little bit so that it wouldn't just wash away <laughs> in a big gully washer that we get around here. Um, it was able to keep it in there and there was a little bit of a, a rise in between each of the rows so that um, that sand kind of held all of my things into my, my rows. Um, but he's just laying this cardboard down. Now what you see here, we'll talk about this in, in a little bit, but those are our, um, our watering. He actually uh, did um, automatic watering in all of our gardens, which is uh, wonderful for out here. Um, so uh, the, ba the main thing here is overlap, overlap, <laughs> overlap. Make sure all the ground is covered. Um, basically, in doubt, throw more down. You really can't put too much of the cardboard or newspaper down because it does <coughs> give you the added barrier that you need. And then you soak them thoroughly. Um, I just would stand there with the soaker hose for quite some time and just drench these, um, each of the cardboard layers to make sure that they weren't going to extract the moisture out of the soil that I was getting ready to put on it. Um, I wanted to make sure that they were already thoroughly saturated, so I just stood there for the longest time saturating them. Then the next layer we brought in was browns, and in our case, because of the wonderful mushroom factory in Madisonville, we were able to go and get a humongous load of mushroom compost. Now, I don't know if, how many of you use mushroom compost in your in your gardens, but oh man, it's it's like the best, and it's so cheap. In fact, most of the time we've been able to get it for free, but the few times we've gone, we paid twelve dollars for an entire trailer bed load, and our trailer is like thirty feet long, so. 
it was a couple big dump trucks, I mean dump loads full into the trailer for $12. So, you know, it just isn't a, a price issue to worry about, but man, you just come home with all kinds of wonderful good um, additives to add to your garden. And so in this, you add two to three inches of the compost material on top of your, um, your cardboard or your paper product. Um, this can also, um, you can add leaves, coffee grinds, wood ash, wood chips, pine straw, peat moss, uh, sawdust, or any decaying plants from previous years. Um, this last year, I didn't do mushroom compost because I had gotten my own big compost bins up and running to the point where I had my own compost to use. So that was a really nice plus. Um, but uh, it, um, you can pretty much do anything, and depending on the scale that you're doing, again, if you want to scale it down, you can just bring in something simple. You know, go around and gather leaves off of your property or your neighbor's property. Um, your coffee grinds, any of those things are uh, great complements to the garden and would be considered part of the browns. And again, you water thoroughly. And because uh, you're putting in a couple of inches, you really need to make sure that you water this really thoroughly to, to really saturate it. Because the whole point of this is to get this to decompose and to create a wonderful, good uh, growing form for your plants. And so, uh, you can't really overwater too much on that. Um, so here you see me out there watering down the mushroom compost after we've dumped it in. And then you bring in, uh, <laughs> we went through and tried to move all of these because the screen cut off the part, but that says greens, and this is in my case bunny and chicken poop. But uh, greens is really based upon um, it can be uh, compost straight out of your kitchen. It can be kitchen scraps. Just remember, um, there are some things that take much longer to decompose, and so you're not going to be able to really use that as a, um, a good growing place until some of those decompose a little bit, depending on what you put in there. And chicken poop is hot, and so uh, when you put it in, it needs to sit for months before you actually plant a plant on top of it. Now, if you've got chicken poop that you've already had resting off to the side, that's been there for a few months, that's ideal. You can add it directly and not have an issue. Um, I raise bunnies and chickens, and so I have an abundance of both. So I have no problem um, with both of those, but I keep a, um, you'll see in when I talk to some of my compost, I keep several compost uh, bins going at all times where I have my bunny and chicken poop in there that I can pull out or use, and it's always in the state of decomposing, and so um, it's really good. Let me say one thing, too. Depending on the size you're doing, if you're doing a small pot or a very small container garden, if you do not have access to bunny poop and don't want to wait for chicken poop to decompose, a great alternative is with worm casting. And you can go buy a bag of worm castings at the co-op for 20 bucks, and that's a big bag. And so you can just do a layer of the worm castings, and that will bring in uh, a complementary element to your back to Eden garden that this has done. Uh, and I will say again, if you use horse or cow manure, one of the things you need to check is making sure that they have not been eating hay or grass that has had herbicides or pesticides in it because all that will pass straight into your garden. It does. And we had a friend who unknowingly did that with horse manure and her garden was ruined and there was no redemption for it. She had to dig it all out and start over because they said it would take, you know, years and years for all of that to completely dissipate. You don't want to grow food where all of that is in the garden bed. So, just be very, very careful um, what you do as far as where you get your manure from. Um, before I realized some of this, at one point when we first got to the property, the people behind us had cows and I would sneak over the fence and get some cow manure and bring it back and, and throw it in some of my plants. Some of it worked and some of it it didn't, but I, it was before I actually did big gardens. I was just doing small little potted things at that point, but I no longer over the garden, over the fence to get their poop. <laughs> I have plenty of my own now. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, another thing that I do that I just, I can't say enough positive things about is comfrey. Um, I don't know how many of you have been familiar with comfrey or know about comfrey, but it is uh, my go-to plant. I actually have three gardens and I have a set, oops, I have um, one that looks like this in all three of my gardens. They do multiply slowly, but they do multiply on their own. But I, I cut and use them so regularly they don't ever get out of control. But they, they're supposedly classified as somewhat invasive plants. So just be aware of that. Don't just like leave it unattended. It will kind of take over. The roots on this thing go down about six feet. So they are serious <coughs> roots. So once they're there, they're there. So just you know think it through where you put them. <laughs> but uh, I have one that I had put out in my backyard when we first got the property and then I decided I didn't want it there so I dug it up and moved it. Well, every every time I mow, I'm mowing over country over there. But the bunny rabbits, the wild bunny rabbits love it. They come over and help me eat it. So, But um, country has a lot of potential, uh, so many uses for it. But um, one of the things I use it for is because it's a mining plant and it extracts the minerals and all the good stuff out of the ground and puts it into its leaves. Its leaves are basically a multivitamin and I actually lay these leaves on my garden bed um, and let the nutrients then, as it decomposes, go into my garden bed um, so that it's feeding that bed, getting it ready for the next planting. So when I'm preparing my bed for fall or if I'm letting it rest for a month or two or whatever, I layer it with the com with the comfrey leaves, and then I come back with wood chips on top of that. So um, it will decompose and then, and then feed the soil. Um, I also dry it. You can see some drying in my greenhouse here. Um, this is edible to plants, both fresh or dry. But right before a freeze, this is right before a big freeze a couple years ago, and so I went out and just took it all because <laughs> it was going to get toasted anyway and hung it up in my greenhouse to dry and then I crumbled it up and put it into uh, both my bunnies and chicks food and it's really packed with like I said lots of vitamins and nutrients but it's also got good protein and the animals love it. My, I give it one leaf to my bunnies and I have about I don't know probably have like 14 bunnies now. Um, I give one leaf to each of my rabbits every week just as a you know, a little bonus. And, and the chickens, I'll just throw a whole bunch in the chicken yard and they just have a serious fighting fit over that. So anyway, they're wonderful plants. If you don't have one, um, I do hope to separate and have some uh, available. If anybody would like one, you can let me know and maybe I can get you a couple of starter plants. It doesn't take much. A little bitty root stuck it in the ground. I mean, it will, it will take off. They are not high maintenance. Um, so they're very easy to grow. So here you see a picture of a garden bed that I have prepped, and here you see all my comfrey leaves laid out across my garden bed before I come back with my final layer of wood chips. So it is just, uh, again, another way to just bring in naturally without having to do chemicals or anything else, and the comfrey just grows crazy, and so you never have to worry about running out. It, it just is always there. Right along with that bunny poop, huh? Right along with the bunny poop. <laughs> and the wood chips. Um, now, we are very blessed that um, one of the things we did when we bought the property is we bought a wood chipper. And when we first, my husband first bought the tractor and wood chipper, I thought he was crazy. He, of course, we were coming from the city. Now, both of us have been exposed and have, have uh, been in the country. My husband was actually raised more in the country. But um, the idea of, you know, a tractor and a wood chipper to me just seemed like really over the top. Do we really need this? Oh my gosh. It was one of the best things we ever bought. And um, because we are always having to take down a tree or a tree has fallen over or the yopon needs to be thinned out, um, we wood chip everything. And of course when you wood chip fresh things with the leaves that's even better because you get all that wonderful decomposing of the leaves as well as the wood chips. And our wood chips come out really nice and small. They're not the big chunky ones that sometimes you have wood chippers do, these are nice and small, so they work really well. 
Um, you can also purchase them or talk to tree services. A lot of times tree services would be more than willing to bring you some free and dump it in your property. Um, but again, you need to make sure that there's no spray coloring or insecticides or anything on the, on the trees or on the wood chips that you are getting because again, all of this is going to be where you're growing your food. And so you just need to make sure it's as, as pure and untainted as possible. Um, and I like to let my wood chips set for quite some time. <laughs> for those of you that have been out to my place know that there is literally oh, probably a dozen wood chip piles that are this tall and this big around in various places because when we have to take down trees or we do some more clearing, you know, the wood chipper just dumps it wherever it is and it just stays there. But the glorious thing is then I leave it and I come back and in about six months or a year, man, those wood chips are so wonderful to then just dive straight into and throw them into the garden because they're already decomposed and coming, breaking down, and they're really nice. So here are some wood chips that I've dumped out here, or my husband's dumped out with the uh, tractor onto my um, my layer of my greens, and so now I'll be spreading those. And like I said, each layer is very important. You don't want to skip a layer, and I do these layers. And again, water after every layer. Don't ever forget that water, water. But I repeat the browns and greens at least two times. Um, when I'm starting up my garden, I go really thick um, and let it really um, have plenty to decompose in there. Um, you could even go three if you wanted to. You're not gonna do too many. But I wouldn't do just one because you're not gonna get enough going in there. Um, the, the bunny poop and the, the, your various, whether it's the worm castings and those kind of things, help to break down the items that are in that garden and so that's what really stimulates the growth um, for your plants and so the more the better on that. Now when you are ready to plant um, you will notice here you've got the wood chips which is not necessarily the easiest place to start putting seeds in and so what I have done is I have a mixture and I'll, I will talk about it here in just a second that I put together, but then I come in and I will do rows and I will just take my little shovel and my trowel and just dig about an inch down. And then I come back and lay this layer of growing medium that's, that's much finer, more conducive for the seeds to grow in and grab hold of. And I will then drop those seeds into that and then come back and dust, do a dusting over the top with a little bit more of that soil, and then I just leave it. Um, and then as the plants come up, you can move those wood chips in if you want to, to cover the ground around it, just to keep that ground around it nice and moist. Um, but the wood chips are what also retain your moisture really, really well. So it's really good to have those as close to those plants once they come up as you, as you can. Um, about all that, sorry. <laughs> so this is what I use for my soil starter mix. Uh, this is what I put together that I, I have in my, in my greenhouse, I have all these items and I usually have at least one of my bins already pre-mixed and ready to go. So if I need to get some quick for some reason, I have it real handy. But I use peat moss, worm castings and happy frog um, soil conditioner and vermiculite and um, this is basically kind of the, 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 pick, the proportions. This happy frog, I, I can't say enough about it. It's fabulous soil. It's wonderful. You can only get it at the co-op that I know of, but you might be able to find it elsewhere. Um, they've been out of it for a month, and it's been on back order, and I'm really upset. So I'm hoping I can go this weekend and get some more. I've got only a little bit left. I usually buy two or three bags at a time because I like to never run out. <laughs> so, but um, all of these things are available at um, the co-op, and you know if you have the space to keep the big bags, then obviously that's the cheaper way to go than buying small bags. But small bags work good too. Now I use this starting soil when I mix up. Um, the, the place where in mean, my own soil to start my seeds and I do all my seed starting um, indoors 
end of January, 1st of February-ish, somewhere in there, depending on my schedule. And um, I have uh, learned this technique of putting the, the saran wrap over them to hold in the moisture um, and to keep them on a heated pad. There's a heating pad underneath these. Um, you can see all the cords. <laughs> they have a little probe that sets inside of the the little tray and it regulates the temperature. You, t you tell the heating pad what temperature you want that soil to be kept at. And this has been the most wonderful way. I have had no issues starting my seeds with this. Um, and then as, they, as the little seeds start to pop up through this, I will take toothpicks and stick it in there and hold the, the saran wrap up just enough so that they are not squished. And then when they, when, when the whole tray is up enough, then I just take the saran wrap off entirely. Um, and then I bring in my grow lights, uh, which I can adjust up or down. And this is all just in my laundry room um, and because it's usually too cold outside. I tried the heating pads out in my greenhouse in January and it didn't work because there's just no way for my heating pad to keep my soil warm enough out there when it's, you know, 30 degrees um, and my, my greenhouse is not heated so um, it didn't work very well. So I have found that starting them inside is the best way to go for me. There's a picture of the heating pad that I use there and um, it really works well. There's a, a close-up of a little probe that goes into the the little um, spot for your plant and then once they really get up and good then I can move them straight out to the greenhouse because now the heat is not so much the issue as much as it is the light and so my greenhouse has got um, electricity and so I have these these lights hung up here and I I raise these up or down I have several different trays that I um, things that I'll put underneath them to move them closer to the lights or farther from the lights based on their height and so forth but um, I have been able to um, start my own seeds for about 80% of my garden um, for the last couple years this way. And it's worked really well. So um, Then when you're ready to move these plants to the garden, um, when the temps are warm enough outside and you feel like, okay, these things are going to survive out here, um, harden them off, obviously. Always set them out on, I set them out on my back patio and just let them get, get used to being outside in a protected environment for about two days. And then I move them into the actual uh, place where these are going to get planted. So these are some of my tomatoes over here that I had seeded and had gotten going. And then I'm putting them in their tomato seeds, I mean the tomato plants um, cages here, which my husband has put together for me. This is actually a picture of this year because this fall we put in this um, drip irrigation system. It's the only bed we have this on that's in my gardens uh, because I wanted to see how much better the tomatoes did with drip irrigation versus the sprayers which the rest of my garden has. But this year's rain has defeated that. <laughs> I am unable to tell if it made a difference or not. So maybe next year I can get a better idea. But um, nonetheless, uh, it, you can see a picture of what the drip irrigation looks like there. Um, so these are, again, some of my other pictures. These are, this is my tomato cage. Now my husband put in down this row, you can see this is a, a long row here, and he put in two big paddle panels, and he's got the T-post stakes so that they're, they're staked along that and then he built me these wonderful tomato cages and we staggered them so I could reach all sides of the tomato. Um, but the tomato cages are big enough that you know you can get your hand in there, your clippers in there, um, and it has, they've worked really, really well. And we're very happy with them. Um, so, and then these are some of the other plants that I have going over here in this one. This is actually my cucumber trellis that I have going here. Um, so some of the benefits of a no-dig gardening. Um, you will be glad that you're not having to dig like most gardens in the ground. Um, once you layer these in there, the weed control is very minimal in the garden itself. Now I have weeds in my path and I have weeds all over uh, around the beds, but I don't have hardly any weeds in my bed. 
And because it is such a wonderful, crumbly, easy to deal with mixture, it, they're like no big deal to just pluck those little things out if you have a few. Um, it's really not a big deal. Um, and by using this, uh, you can eliminate uh, household waste by composting and throwing all kinds of things in this garden. So it's just a wonderful resource to use things. Let me back up, because one of the things that I didn't, I meant to say earlier, um, one of the reasons it kind of prompted me into doing this type of gardening was um, I have some severe food allergies. Uh, my allergist actually um, quit charging me for my visits because she was using me as her uh, speaking points on several conferences because I broke all the rules. I had allergies across all the boards. And we determined that basically a lot of it was based on the pesticides and, the, and even the genetically modified seeds. Both of those were contributing factors. So part of this was I needed to see if I could grow food that I could eat, that I shouldn't be able to eat, but I could eat it without reaction. And uh, I'm happy to say I can. <laughs> and it, has, it, was a, it was a really big deal the first time I, because one of my big reactions is to cantaloupe and watermelon, all melons. I can't touch them. And um, so after growing for a couple of years, my husband's like, come on, you should really try this. And I'm just like, okay, EpiPen in hand, you know, here we go. Because I go into anaphylactic shock. I mean, literally all my breathing tubes close up. So it's not a light deal if you, you know, have an issue. So um, I did. I was eating it and I was perfectly fine. And so now again, I use non-genetically modified seeds and I grow completely organic. So none of the things that we were thinking were probably behind all of my reactions were in the mix and I was safe. So I was like, okay, yay, score, good for me. So anyway, just as a side note, if you know anybody who has food allergies, this might be something to look at. Um, and another good benefit is you're not going to have to worry about depleting your soil of nutrients like you would in most gardens because you are, after every planting, you replenish the soil again. And so um, you are constantly adding the nutrients back into your soil. Um, and so it is a wonderful process. I just love the cycle of life. The, you know, the wonderful thing about living out here is you can actually see the, the actual cycle of life take place. You know, the, the bunnies eat the food and then the bunnies poop and the poop goes back in the ground and the ground grows food. You know, it kind of all happens over and over again. So, so um, I just find this is a, a wonderful way to grow, um, grow things. This is a sign my da daughter had made because I love this saying says life began in a garden and um, it's true and life does begin in a garden all kinds of wonderful things even birds I've had birds build nests in numerous places in my gardens which is wonderful because then mom is right there to eat all my bugs for me so <laughs> it's very helpful so these are just some of the pictures of my garden so as you as I talked about we had um, my a small backhoe which really was nice um, to help us dig out this garden bed because it was just, I wish you could have seen the picture of it before, but you could probably imagine, you know, how dense the yopan was. Um, and then my husband was so great to put in all of my watering. He has just run watering all over the place and it has been a huge undertaking, but oh my gosh, it's so beneficial to have the watering there. This is what the sprinklers look like on most of my garden beds. Um, and then I have the one that's been recently converted to the drip irrigation. This is us preparing uh, another bed. We had the three beds existing for a year and then we came in and decided to do this one. We have space to do one more that we still have not done. And I haven't done it because so far this garden bed has been where I've been growing my melons and pumpkins and things like that and they of course take over the world. And so whatever would be in the next bed would be overtaken by them anyway. So at this point I'm not doing anything, but we might end up actually doing that. This is a picture of the mushroom compost. You can see the trailer. This is the, my husband put sides and stuff on it. Let me go back, you can see. This is a big long trailer. And you know, we paid 12 bucks for that. <laughs> just unbelievable how much you could get for it. And uh, then we would just spread it around. This is us you know, uh, adding various layers to the garden a little at a time. 
Um, we tried potato cages one year, which actually worked pretty good. There's some potato cages there. Um, and this is some more additives to the garden. Okay, these are my couple of my compost bins. This is my new big compost bin that my husband built me um, a year ago. And um, my problem was the things that I was pulling out of my gardens, particularly the big viney things, your squash, zucchini, all of those cu uh, cucumbers too, uh, melons, all of those vines are so big, and so, so troublesome to decompose. They take a long time. And I had a pile just basically setting where this is that I just pull out and plopped there. Then I come back a year later and there wasn't much decomposing. Mean, it was decomposing, but not very fast. So I decided the only way to really speed it along was to just combine some more of my bunny and chicken poop to just kind of get that heat going in there and kind of get it to decompose. And so he actually built me this. And again, you can see we always do cardboard underneath everything that we're doing like this just to prevent things from coming up. And so I threw away in um, all my stuff from the garden and then add layer upon layer of my residue from my animals. and. Like I said, last year was the first year that I had enough to actually pull out and do my own, which was really wonderful. These are a couple of my other compost bins. These are by the house. These are more for scraps around the house. And I will occasionally haul up a load of bunny and chicken poop to throw in there again just to add some, some more grains to it because there's a lot of, we add leaf clippings and yard clippings and things in here that, um, are more browns, but sometimes you need to have that heat going, so I will bring in some more of the bunny and chicken poop. And then I sift my compost, um, which Richard has a picture of it, or has it on the video that's after this. Um, this is a sifter that my husband built me that fits right inside my wagon. You can see my wagon sitting here, and you can see the sifted soil underneath. And so all of this stuff up here, I can just shake this shifter, this sifter, and then what falls through is this, this beautiful consistency of a sifted soil. And it, I just love the fact that this was just scraps, you know, and now it's wonderful soil. Um, and so that's, that's what I do. And then I bag this. I will, um, I use all my, my old chicken and bunny food bags, and I just fill it up with the, the sifted compost and store it in my greenhouse. That way it's ready for me when I'm ready to do pots or do whatever. It's, it's right there. So these are the tomato cages that I was telling you about that have worked really, really well. And these are just some pictures of my garden in bloom. You can see here are my tomatoes. Um, I don't know if that's, mm, that looks like melons, actually. Then you can see this was this was one of my first years before I got to where I was. We weren't we weren't living here all the time when I first got this garden going. I will say that we were only here um, about four days a week. Our first year we started this garden. So in the days that I wasn't here, you know, Jumanji took over. And so um, this would what I come back to and these these walkways these walkways are wide intentionally wide because I wanted to get my wheelbarrow and my cart down them without having worry about it, but I wouldn't be able to walk down these parts because I'd come back and I'd be like, oh my gosh, the world was taken over by my melons and my pumpkins and zucchini, and so this first year I kind of just let them do whatever, but I got better about staying on top of them after that. But these are my um, cucumber trellises, which I love to grow the cucumbers on because it makes it real easy to pick. And we have an abundance of cucumbers. <laughs> And then here's my, my little frog, he likes it. And it, oh, I, I have to tell you, yesterday I was in the garden and I have this little garden snake that he and I had this conversation. I pick him up and talk to him on a regular basis because you know, I, I want him to help me you know, stay on top of things. And yesterday he was like this long, I couldn't believe how big he was. But anyway, so the little critters in the garden. <laughs> and this is my pumpkin, it's in my, my third garden. And these will literally take off and go into the woods, and we're pulling pumpkins out of everywhere. And I get about 30 pumpkins a year out of my pumpkins, which is really great because I, I love to decorate with pumpkins. Um, but I also love to eat pumpkins, but 
my chickens really love to eat pumpkins. And so we have uh, lots and lots of pumpkins that we can hang on to throughout the year and feed them. This is more pictures of my gardens. You can just see them all growing there. My cucumbers hanging down. I just love the way it's, it, they're so pretty to have them hanging down in there and get them that way. And this over here is my cold room. This is what my husband built me, um, I guess it was the beginning of this year. We've been deciding, well, we've been tossing around doing a cold root cellar. Um, but do the reality of doing that <laughs> is just not very, wasn't very conducive to our lifestyle. I just, we just didn't get to it. So we have a, a pretty good sized barn and he decided to take a section of this we triple insulated the sides and put a small AC unit in there and it keeps everything at the perfect temperature for me. Um, and to, on a side note, um, we run off solar and so the good thing is, is their ACs run off, you know, sun power so it doesn't cost us anything. So <laughs> it was easier than trying to dig a hole in the ground to figure that out. So, and this is much easier to walk in and out of. So. Um, it has worked really well. It stored. I literally just took my last pumpkin out of there uh, two weeks ago to give to my chickens. So it lasted through the whole winter and um, has done really well for a good. These are just some of the pictures. Okay, this was this was my harvest a couple. Uh, I guess it was last year, 2020. This is this year. I have been over the top with my tomatoes this year. Um, literally, I am canning. Um, about every other day right now with tomatoes um, and so we are just going to be stocked on the tomato front and the tomatillas. I've had tons and tons of tomatillas. I've got all kinds of green salsa put away for the for the coming, coming years. So this is me canning and I really have uh, really love the way I've done it this year. I'm actually doing it in my crock pot this year which saves me a lot of time and it works so much better. I don't have to worry about it stirring it or it burning on the bottom. And I have been able to make some of the thickest, wonderful spaghetti sauce this year. So I'm pretty excited. It's, it's been really nice to see that. So anyway, I, I had tons and tons of carrots um, last year and I, I like to try to let my things occasionally go to seed so I can harvest the seeds because I, I want to know how to. I don't want to be dependent on necessarily always having to rely on getting seeds. And so um, I have had several experiments of trying around and getting seeds this year, and they've so far worked good. Now, hopefully those seeds will work next year when I put them in the ground, but um, I've had, had quite a few. Um, my carrots last year, I had so many carrots that I was uh, had just more than I could can, and so I decided to dehydrate them. And this small bag right here, was four cups of carrots before I dehydrated them, which was just amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, this saves so much space. So, and then you can just throw them into warm water, let them hydrate, and then throw them into whatever you want. And I've done that with sweet potatoes too. I've done really well. So, this is my, oh, my, my biggest watermelon weighed 49.9 pounds. <laughs> it was huge. This was um, a video um, I grew jicama for the first time last year. So this year, I planted jicama for the first time. Today I harvested them because we had a frost. And this was my first one I pulled out of the ground, which is pretty small. Then, the next one, which is about the average size you'd get from a grocery store. Then... I got this one, which is a very large one. And then I unearthed this guy, which is quite mammoth. Look how big this thing is. I don't know how much he weighs, but he is one big old honking guy. And then I got this guy. who was even bigger. He's massive have to be some of the hugest jicama I've ever seen. I'd say overall that was a So anyway, I thought that was a pretty good success for my first year with jicama. And I have to tell you, I, I love jicama. We buy jicama a lot. And 
now I'm not just being, you know, because I grew it, but oh my gosh, it was the best cake that I've ever eaten. It was so good. And I don't really know what the difference was, but man, I was a firm believer. So I've got hickama going again this year. So anyway, when I when I harvest, I'll have to spread some out because, you know, it's just so good. You guys have got to try it. So. Explain so what it is. Um, explain what hickama is. Yes. Hickama is a root. It looks like a turnip almost. Um, but it has a texture of a cross between an apple and a water chestnut. A water chestnut, yeah, pretty much a cross between those two. It's, it has a slight sweetness like an apple. It's very juicy. When you bite into it, it's nice and juicy and crisp. We love them in salads. I could eat them plain, but they're great in salads. They're, they're just, they're great raw. Um, and here's the one thing I really love about them is um, because we were doing keto there for the longest time. Um, you can cut them up and throw them into your soup, like a chicken soup, and it will absorb the soup flavor and never get mushy. So it's a substitute for potatoes. Because you think you're having a potato, but you're not. You're having, and, and it, it, it gets a little soft, but it never gets mushy, but it absorbs the soup flavor. So um, it is a wonderful substitute into those kinds of things. So anyway, just a side note on that. Um, yes, and it's good for not only just veggies, but it's also good for flowers. And there's some of my flowers. But I also wanted to suggest there are two books that I brought that I really highly recommend uh, for gardening in the woods. Because if you're like me, you've got so many trees. Um, which we actually have found to be not necessarily a bad thing. We have cleared out some trees around the garden, but I let them have quite a bit of the trees around it for numerous reasons. It protects the garden from flying insects. I find myself, that it's like they just don't fly over the trees to get to the garden, so you have a little bit less insects. The birds are, are much more likely to be there. We've got lots of trees for them to not only nest in, but to hide in, so the birds are... Um, very good with that um, but it also provides some shade for normally our summers are scorchingly hot which thankfully this year has not been the case but uh, normally by you know this time of year tomatoes are just you know being fried and so um, it's kind of nice to have a little bit of shade on the garden as well and I have seen no issues with uh, my plants not growing well um, now they still they still get a good six hours of sun, but it's not like an open field where it gets morning to night, you know, sun exposure. So anyway, if you uh, want some good books to read, those are a couple really good books. And that's it. Good morning, my name is Michelle Eldridge and I'm a Leon County resident who moved here a few years ago from the city. And uh, we have begun an adventure out here in the woods and I welcome you to come join me on my garden adventure. Uh, just as a reference, I am standing in front of our well which we put in and I just couldn't leave anything without some kind of decoration in front of it and so I did a small garden in front of it. But uh, we uh, will now go and check out some of our big gardens that we have. We're going to be talking about various parts of putting together a back to Eden style garden or a layer style garden and one of the key ingredients in that is wood chips. We happen to have a wood chipper and so as you can see we are in the woods. We do have a lot of opportunity to cut up various trees and yopons and make our own wood chips which is quite wonderful. These wood chips are just a beautiful texture as you can see and because it's cold out here you can see that the, the heat is coming off of these, which is just lovely. I love that in the, in the cold. So they're already starting to decompose. This was just ground a few days ago. So you can see how quickly Mother Nature kicks in to start decomposing the wood chips. I just wanted to show you one of my compost bins. This is my newest one. This is our big one that we have next to my big garden. This is mainly to hold all of the things I pull out of my big garden. A lot of the vines from any of the cucumbers or all my squashes, zucchinis, all those things which have such big vines, 
um, are wonderful to compost, but they take a while to decompose. So we built this so that I can combine a lot of my bunny and rabbit poop in with it, which speeds up the process a whole lot and really makes, uh, makes it work so much faster. And so anyway, this is, this is one of my, uh, my compost bins that I have. So this is my big garden that we put in and um, as you can see my sign here because I just loved that saying because life does begin in the garden and I love seeing new life come forth. And so come with me and we'll go see my big garden. Well this is um, our big garden and in here uh, we're kind of sparse because we're like at the end of the growing season but we do have a few things. You still see a few of my zucchinis which are got a a few baby ones coming on. We'll see if any of them make it. I have a, a lot of oregano going here. And then over here, this is a, a wonderful spinach that um, we just love at Vines. And it's called Giant Noble Spinach. And uh, we feed this regularly to the animals as well as ourselves. Um, it's best pick early in the morning. And I'll just come out and pick little leaves off and leave the vine. And it just continues to grow. Uh, I also have some pepper plants here, which have done really well this year, and we have all different kinds of peppers in here, but uh, they're all, we have everything from super hot to some, I have some giant macarons, which, eh, they're in here somewhere, they're not as, they're just babies right now, I've got some bigger ones, these things get to be these things get to be about this big when they're full grown. And they're sweet peppers. And then over here we have banana peppers. And this year I also started jicama for the first time. And so I've got some jicama plants down here. These will be harvested as soon as the leaves start to fall off. I've already picked some of the seeds pods and have them in the house drying. Um, so I will have a abundant supply of seed pods this year from these guys. So. Um, that will be fun. These are my tomato cages and my husband built me these and these have worked wonderfully. They're just stock panels. We have one long stock panel running the distance of this garden bed and then we built these so that I can have my tomatoes inside of them. I can manage them, keep them contained, trim them, you know, harvest and do whatever I need to and it really works very well, much better than most tomato cages do. I found it to be the best solution for my tomatoes and I had an abundant crop of tomatoes this year. I, I think I canned two days every week all summer. <laughs> it was unbelievable how much I got out of my tomatoes. Um, if you come over here to this garden bed, this bed is completely done now for the winter and that's one of the things we're going to be talking about is prepping your garden bed for the winter. This was where I had my watermelon and my cantaloupe which then had the ability and did so extend all the way up and over the fence, did their little climbing things. Um, but as you can see, this has now got its final layer on here of the wood chips. But as you can see, this was only done a few weeks ago, but it is already decomposing nicely. And so this will be a wonderful bed to plan in next spring. And I put the final layer, uh, of wood chips and my layer of poop on to just let it continue to season through the winter and then come spring it will be in perfect shape for me to put my new plants in. This is my comfrey plant and I have this in every one of my gardens. So I have uh, th uh, three gardens so I have some in every one. This is one of the most amazing plants. This plant is incredibly hardy down here because it is it does grow really well um, and will come back year after year even in the hardest of freezing and frost because it grows up north. It can sometimes survive through the entire winter down here if we don't get super cold. But this is a wonderfully packed nutritionist plant that I can feed to my animals, either raw or dry. Um, it is also, um, its nickname is called Bone Knit because it actually has the healing ability to help your body knit its bones and heal wounds twice as fast. It's been proven. And so I make a salve out of this and some coconut oil and I keep it on hand at all times and whenever we have a wound, I use it on it. But it's also great as a comfrey tea. There's a lot of things you can do with comfrey. 
it's a very versatile plant and I highly recommend anybody who has a garden to try to get some of this going. It, it does uh, spread, so you have to be careful and keep it in a contained area and stay on top of it. But as you can see, this one's been in the ground here for four years, so it hasn't gone too crazy. We do keep it trimmed back pretty well. One of its key uses that I use it for in the garden is for fertilizer. Because this plant is actually called a mining plant, it actually extracts nutrients out of the ground and puts it into the leaves. That makes these leaves like a multivitamin. And so what I do in the middle of my growing seasons, I will pick leaves and drop them at the base of my tomato plants about the time that they're just starting to set the tomatoes on. And as they decompose, it just adds the nutrients right back into the tomatoes, which is fabulous. You can also make a, um, a solution out of this by putting a, a whole handful of this into a bucket with water. And I suggest you cover the bucket because it can get smelly but you leave the bucket set for at least a week or two until it gets nice and fermented and then you mix about 10 to 10 to 1 rations with that mixture and water and I fertilize all my plants in the garden. I have a bucket of this available at both of my garden areas so I can just dip in whenever I see a plant that might need some extra nutrients I can add that to it no problem. This is one of the beds in my big garden where I have some things going for the winter. I have just planted a few rows of some additional things uh, in the summer, this was all my carrots, and I had my best crop of carrots ever. I uh, was able to can and dehydrate um, and freeze carrots, so I will eat carrots all winter long with no problem. But uh, this is also my, my hoops. This is where I grow my cucumbers, and I'll show those hopefully in the spring when we start to get some cucumbers growing, but it's also a great place to grow other crops that um, like shade until the cucumbers completely uh, eliminate the ability for them to have any sun I, uh, I can have things growing underneath there. Right now I've got some broccoli and some various things, some lettuces and radishes coming up there. I just planted some uh, purple hole peas here so they haven't sprouted yet but they're going to take over the trellis and they will be up here through the winter which is a great use for this in the winter as well. You will notice we have sprinklers throughout our garden. My husband was a wonderful help. He, he was the one who did all this for me. Uh, we did the above ground sprinklers before we really learned a whole lot more about the uh, drip irrigation. So we intend to actually transfer a couple of our beds, particularly the tomatoes, to a drip irrigation because it's a much better uh, source of water for the tomatoes. But this works fine for now. We do have it on a sprinkler system which is in our coop and it runs automatically in the middle of the night and so uh, it does not have to worry about being scorched by the sun. Um, and with this style of uh, gardening, the moisture is retained so well is that we don't have to water nearly as much as a regular garden. But it is important to have a source of water, so we're real lucky that we were able to get all the watering system in for all of these. So one of the things that's important about this style of gardening is it is one of the names is called the no-till or the no-dig garden because you don't actually till or mess up the layering system as much as possible. You try to reserve the, the decomposing that is taking place naturally which just feeds the plants. And so um, when you do plant, um, like when I lay these new plants, in, these new seeds in here, you will see there's a darker soil in there because I do lay a small trench of a specialty soil just on top to help those seeds grab root. But if I'm transplanting actual plants, I just barely dig in and make a small hole and just lay my new transplanted plant right in to that hole and then I can move these right around it and they will be just fine. But when I am laying new seeds, I do like to put down uh, just a small amount of a, a mixture of soil that does help those seeds to flourish. One of the things you have to know is you really shouldn't start seeds in a highly composted soil. It's not as good for them and that's why I do a mixture of a peat moss and frog soil and a little bit of plant food as my mixture that I lay my seeds into. This is the back side of my coop and this is something we learned from doing some research online about raising chickens and being able to utilize the poop because when they sleep all night they poop a lot and that poop can just get wasted and lost if you're unable to somehow catch it and so my husband built me this coop with this what we call the poop chute and I have my wheelbarrow typically placed 
under here and I have a scraper. You can see some of it falling out. But all the poop will fall onto this and I can scrape it out into my wheelbarrow and I can keep everything and use it in my garden. Nothing gets lost. So this is the front side of my coop and in here I have not only chickens but I also have rabbits that I raise, both of which provide wonderful uh, feeding opportunities for my garden with their poop. So in here I have my, my rabbits, I've got a couple litters that I've just, just had, uh, they're right at six weeks old right now, and I've got some of my breeder rabbits over here. I've got some baby chicks down here that are about ready to go into the coop. And then over here we have all my big chickens and my rooster. And you can see this is where the, the chickens sit and poop all night long and it's caught into the poop chute. We have laying boxes on the side here and we have an automatic door which lets them in and out and keeps them safe at night. This coop my husband built and it has a buried hardware cloth three feet out on all sides so that nothing has the ability to dig in and everything's reinforced with cattle panels. So uh, thank the Lord we've had no issues with any animals getting in here besides a few snakes which I've had to kill but other than that, that's it. <laughs> um, and we have our fans set up on automatic. They turn on when it's hot automatically one turns on at 80 and one turns on at 85 because the rabbits do get a little warm in the summer but other than that they kind of take care of themselves our uh, outdoor pen which you can see is completely enclosed we are as you can tell in the middle of the woods so lots of predators and we needed to make sure that nothing would have access to our critters so luckily we did not had anything get into it we did have a a limb fall and bust one of our pipes over there just last week, so my husband's got to fix that. But I love to sit here and talk to my chickens. So We built this this summer. This is our cold room in lieu of putting in a root cellar. This is for me to keep things cool and store them. Come on in. So this room has my storage of pumpkins and squash. Ah, and you can see this one's already going bad on me. It's going to have to go to the chickens. So when they start to go bad, I take it to the chickens. But uh, this, we have an air conditioning unit in here. Actually, this is the old one. We we're getting ready to put a new one in here. But uh, this works great to keep our, our vegetables and things cool. We do intend to put shelves on the other side, but this is what we have for today. So here are two of my other compost bins. This one I just emptied, and so I have just thrown a few things inside of it. But when I empty my compost bin of its compost because it's ready to be used, I lay a fresh layer of cardboard in the bottom to just keep the, the uh, things from coming up through my compost. And then I go ahead and start my compost. This was some um, had lots of good leaves and stuff in it from when we were wood chipping recently. I will throw a bunch of uh, chicken and bunny poop in here and then start with my normal composting. This compost bin is, as you can see, it's full and it's done. It needs to sit. It's not completed. It just needs to now be turned and let it continue to cook and decompose until it's ready. So it will probably be another month at least before I can use this one. But I have bagged up all of this and it's sitting in my greenhouse ready to use in my garden. I, this is my sifter that I use. Um, I put my compost in here and it fits inside my wagon and I'm able to shake it and use my hand and it creates a wonderful soil that comes through the bottom and I'll show you that when we get to the greenhouse. So this was my very first garden I ever had. It's called our container garden, obviously because it's got containers in it. Um, this was our makeshift garden when we were not living here full time, but it gave me the ability to have some plants. Um, and keep them somewhat protected and they did really well while we were not living here full time. Again you can see some comfrey over here and these beds have been prepared and these actually have soil from my uh, compost bins. Um, I have a little bit of celery left, a few herbs, looks like the uh, 
<laughs> Some of this basil didn't like the uh, cold temperatures last night. But my um, mint and other herbs are doing good. I've got other spinach and things going. I've got my blackberry bush, which has sprouted some babies, and so I've got several babies coming up in numerous places. I had a really good crop of blackberries off that bush last year, so I'm looking forward to having a few more, a few more blackberries out of the additional bushes. So this is our newest garden. My husband's called it the rose garden because we have a rose trellis across the entrance. And this garden is uh, where I've still got some more prepping to do for the winter, which was one of the things I wanted to show. This garden bed here is where I had my pumpkins. And after pulling up the vines, it now needs its next winter layering in order to get it prepped for winter. And so I'm going to bring those components in and we'll put them on the garden bed. So because this has already had multiple layers from previous plantings, I'm not having to start from scratch. But I basically just try to lay the ground out a little bit more even if it's been torn up by digging up the things that were there. And any of these things that are there from the leftover are perfectly fine. I then lay down my comfrey so that as it decomposes it can add nutrients back into the ground. And I come back with a layer of wood chips. Do this. And I layer a layer of poop. And I will actually do this probably one more time before I call it good. This is bunny poop straight out of my coop. And I just sprinkle it on nicely to make sure that everything gets some good nutrition. The good thing about this style of gardening is you don't have to be perfect. Close is good. And I'll do that one more time and then it will sit all winter and come next spring, it'll be just right. So this is, I bagged up my compost out of that compost bin that I said I'd emptied out. This bag here is the unsifted compost. And you can see there's still chunks of stuff in here that need to be sifted out. I didn't have time to sift it at the time and it actually needed to dry out a little bit more before it would sift better. This is the one that is sifted. And you can see it is wonderful. It just falls straight through your hands. It's very nice. This is what I put into my gardens, and especially into pots. It's great into pots, but that is what I get out of my compost bins. So we are back in the garden, and it is April, end of April, almost May. And I just wanted to show you a few of the things that we have going on right now. Over here I've got my kale and broccoli that I'm letting go to seed. And I'm going to try to harvest this seed this year so that I have my own seed um, production and so this is an experiment I've not done it before so we'll try I've got some of my uh, cauliflower coming in I've got a little baby head in that one um, and these were in the some of these were in the ground during the freeze and managed to survive and some things um, I had moved to the greenhouse since they were in pots uh, and then some things I planted since the freeze so it was such a rough winter but um, over here we've got my spinach, I've got some sage and parsley. My mint has come back beautifully. And my rosemary, I, I, I did cover it, but it survived the winter. It doesn't look its best, but it survived. <laughs> and my celery is coming up back there. It was planted before the freeze, and it seems to be doing okay. Um, and I've got some giant, this is called mammoth. Uh, beets over here and some kairobi over there and then of course my comfrey is in full bloom right now which is always fun when it's, it sets all of its flowers on the flowers are so pretty and uh, they're all very happy despite the winter we had 
And then my cabbages here. I've also got some, this is some of my vining spinach that was coming up voluntary in the wrong place in my big garden. So I just stuck them in here and thought I'm going to get them to grow on this uh, this year. So I'll have a little spinach from that as well. So I've got two kinds of spinach. This is your regular almost leaf-like spinach and this is a vining spinach. Uh, that's called uh, uh, giant noble spinach. And then I had more tomato plants take than my big garden could handle so I ended up putting some in here just because I had nowhere else to put them. And so I've got, uh, I've got four tomato plants going here as well. And then, of course, herbs and some of my uh, other veggies and things going on here. So, but it's coming along. Back to the Eden gardening. When you put seeds in the ground, you have to lay down a good base of soil that's not as covered with wood chips. And I do a mixture. And I just mix this up. This is also what I start all my seeds in every year. Now I'm ready to lay some seeds now. And, and what is your mixture? I'll have it in the video too, mm -hmm. or in the, but it's, it is a happy frog soil conditioner, which you can get at the co-op, peat moss, worm castings, and vermiculite. All right, so I make a little opening in the wood chips to allow the seeds and the new soil to have a good spot. And then depending on how deep your seeds have to go, I come back with a thin layer of my soil And then I drop my seeds in. This is calendula, calendula flowers. And I will just sprinkle these in here. I want them a little thick. A few more. And then I come back with just a thin coating. And then tamp it down just a touch just to keep any wind from blowing on it. And that's it. But every time you plant a new plant, you always want to put down some some good uh, soil mixture because this is just not as conducive for seeds to take root in right up front. Now below this, the soil is is more conducive, but you don't always want to set your seeds that far down. And so by doing this, you create a surface closer to the top and then those those roots go in and grab hold of all the good stuff down below no problem. I just seeded these the other day. I just seeded this one the other day as well. You can see those are coming up nicely. Um, but it, it takes a few days for the seeds to, to come through. Um, I was going to show you my kiwi plant. This I wasn't sure was going to survive the winter we had. And my husband built me this new trellis this spring so that it had a good place to grow and it has come back like gangbusters. And this will be the year that I'll be able to get fruit for the first time. And kiwi flowers in May and then the fruit sets on after the flower. So I'm pretty excited. You have to plant a male and female with the kiwis in order for them to pollinate. And so I've got uh, one male plant and three female plants here. And uh, hopefully we will have kiwi this summer. My apple tree did good through the winter despite the 
the freeze and ice and everything else. Uh, I was surprised that my fig tree made it through the winter. It actually had, it suffered trauma. I had one of the limbs come down and break the two limbs. It just broke it smack in the middle. But I bound it together down there and it seems to be reviving quite well. So I'm really happy with that. Only thing I lost was my bay leaf tree, so I had to plant a new bay leaf tree. But everything else seems to have done okay. Um, got my pumpkins going in the ground. So in a matter of about a month and a half, this will be overrun with pumpkins. The fences here are trying to keep them contained <laughs> so they don't take over my whole garden. And my strawberries, actually, the bigger plants were in the ground before the freeze, and I had them covered up, and they survived. I uncovered them and expected them to be dead, and they were fine. I had ordered new plants because I thought I was losing those. The new ones are just kind of, you know, just starting because they were just little tiny slips. But I'm getting strawberries on my plants that survived the freeze, so... And down here I have uh, all my zinnias. These are zinnia seeds that I had harvested off all my zinnias from last year. I, I cut off all the heads, dried them, saved them, and then this spring I just scattered hundreds of the seeds in several places. But you can see the, the zinnias coming up all through there. And then those are sunflowers that I started in the greenhouse that are coming up in the, in the little tomato cages there. I've got some other flowers going in there too, but those are the main ones. And I, I thought I lost my flambago, and so I bought another one, but as I was getting ready to dig this one up, I noticed the roots had some life to them, so I left it, and sure enough, the flambago is coming back. It's gonna be slow. It was up to about here and massive last year, so I have a little one here too. And then in my rose bush, which is just very happy this year, despite the crazy winter. So here we are in the big garden, and I am just starting to see some of my cucumbers, which will take over this trellis. I've got some on that side, and I've got uh, six plants on this side, and they will take over the whole arch, which makes it wonderful because then the cucumbers hang down and make it real easy to harvest. These are some of the things that I had in through the winter, and most of them survived and they're doing fine. The kale, um, we've got my cabbage here, broccoli, which is pretty much spent, but I've still got another broccoli head coming on there, and then my radishes, and I've also planted a few more new radishes here. Once this gets covered with greenery then everything under here won't won't be able to survive so I will harvest everything of this as um, the light is you know blocked from from the things above it but these radishes which are some that were in the ground through the freeze um, actually have done really well oh, I'm just gonna pull this one out this is a white icicle radish and they are hot and they are so good, um, but I just wanted to show you what they look like. They are they definitely have some heat. You don't want to grow or eat these unless you can handle a horseradish or something along that, that line, but I love them. They are so good. Uh, over here we have my carrots. These were actually in the ground before the freeze, and a lot of them got really stunted by, I had this whole area covered, but some of these didn't do as well, but if some of them are, are holding on, <laughs> I've got a few coming up there. This is my flat kale, and believe it or not, it survived. I had laid tomato cages down to kind of keep my cover held up and covered this whole thing, and they, they survived the winter and everything and are just going gangbusters, so it's wonderful. My arugula also survived the winter, and then I've planted these since the freeze, and this one you can tell is already doing so much better than those guys over there. 
Um, and these guys I just planted, I staggered them, so I'll have a staggered harvesting on those. But this Swiss chard has been in the ground now two years, and it has gone right through winters, right through this winter, and doesn't seem very daunted by the circumstances of the winter, thankfully, and they're doing good. I've got uh, some things I just put in the ground here. Some of these things I put in by seeds and some of these things are things that I started in the greenhouse. Um, I've got some uh, cauliflower and broccoli going here. These right here are bush beans and you can see that they're just popping through. These are going to get, you know, um, about this tall and this big around. They'll be, they'll be good for here. These are pole beans. They're going to grow on here. And then over here I have potatoes, and this is kind of a, a, a whoops because these potatoes were planted in the ground before the freeze and then I dug them up to see if anything was happening. They looked like they were all dead, so I went ahead and planted some squash over there that's going to run this direction, but then the potatoes decided to come back. So I'm going to have potatoes interwoven with my squash vines <laughs> on this area. So. It's just, oh well. Um, again, my comfrey is doing great. Some of it is already starting to bloom. I've got peppers started here, and these will just get huge. These, these get to be, you know, four and five feet tall. They get huge. These are some peas that I've got going here. And then this is squash. And these are some other peas going here. And then this is zucchini. And then that's my spinach that I had uprooted a few and stuck into the other garden. This is a, a, the giant noble spinach, which vines beautifully. It will take over this trellis. And this stuff is the hardiest thing you've ever seen. I could pull up a sprout off the ground over there and hand it to you, and you could instantly have a plant that goes crazy. And it reseeds itself. I don't ever do anything. So makes it very nice. My uh, oregano mother plant in the middle died, but all the baby plants around it survived the winter. And they seem to be just doing quite well. Uh, so I decided to pull out the mother plant and I planted sunflower seeds there. So I'll have sunflowers growing up there and uh, it'll give a nice ornamentation to the garden. And my lone little uh, basil plant, I stuck there before this really began to intrude upon its space, so we'll see if it survives there. <laughs> I don't know. And then over here we have all my tomatoes that I've got in the ground. Now these are my tomatillas, and they are doing well. And with tomatillas, you have to have multiple in order for them to cross-pollinate. And this has been a, a good arrangement for me to have a good amount of tomatillas. You'll notice that this year we added the drip irrigation on the tomatoes. And so while we left the poles with our water sprinkling system there, my husband has made it so that we can open up the valve and switch between the sprinkler heads or the drip irrigation. So we don't have to uh, only have one or the other. We can choose back and forth if we want to. But it's just on drip irrigation right now. And so you can see the tomato plants, these were all started from seed, um, are really starting to take off. I've got my garlic in between them here, as well as the marigolds, which work to keep the bugs down. And uh, these I use to help keep them upright when they're young and little because it's hard to get them to grow straight up when they're, they're young in this bigger of a spot. But once they get to be certain height, then it's real easy to maneuver them up and keep them upright in these cages. And again, I had so many tomatoes that took seed that I ended up adding some tomato cages here just to accommodate the volume of tomato plants that I had. So. I have got probably about 10 more tomato plants this year than I did last year, so I'm going to have lots of tomatoes. And these are some more peppers all along here. And then this is my jicama, which I just put in the ground, and you have to seed these. You can't, you can't transplant these. These guys are just starting to come up. This one hasn't popped up yet, but it will soon. 
my jicama from last year was amazing. And uh, so I'm real excited to grow jicama again this year. And these are my watermelons. Some of them are coming up and some of them are still in seed. I just seeded again because they, they didn't come up very well. But these are cantaloupes here. And then my onions. And once my onions are harvested, I'll probably add more cantaloupe and melon over there. So it's starting to take shape. It still has a ways to go before we're in production mode, but we are definitely getting there. So this is the rose garden and we're back in my gardens and it is the end of June, almost July. And you can see we've had some changes. I have some squash going here. This is all pumpkin back here that is just starting to take off and as the pumpkin set on this will actually take off and go over the fence we'll actually be picking pumpkins out over there <laughs> when they get full full blown my strawberries are at the very end we have a few left but not much and then the rest of that is just my flowers and I seeded these from my zinnias from last year by saving all the heads and then rubbing them in my hands and scattering them this spring and you can see some of the some of the wind picked up some and I didn't want to pull them so I've got some growing in my path but uh, I love to I love to grow zinnias they're just a little beat down we had three and a half inches of rain last night so everything's a little droopy this morning <laughs> so we are in the container garden and um, Again, things are a little beat down from the rain last night, but I wanted to show you my mullein plants. I try to keep several mullein plants um, in pots and, and where I can get to them, as well as letting them grow wild, which they do everywhere around out here, because they're such a useful plant. There's so many benefits to a mullein, and when it puts out the flower stalk, it's in its second year, and, that, and after this it will die. Um, but in the flower stalk are seeds that will... Um, then pollinate and then create new um, plants next year. But these leaves are amazing in tea. I, um, I dry these and they take a long time to dry. They're very soft and fuzzy. They're in the uh, lamb's ear family and they are just super soft and fuzzy. Uh, in fact, uh, back in the olden days, people use this for toilet paper. So if you run out, it's always a resource, I guess. But, um, but this is... Um, really really helpful for respiratory cough and respiratory lung issues. Um, I have read about people actually even smoking it in a pipe to bring soothing relief to your lungs which I've not done but um, I do like to have it on hand and dried. Um, it is only available in the summer so um, in the winters when you're sick and need it and so that's when I try to do it. Also the flowers I pick and put into olive oil and let set for six weeks and then you strain the flowers out and it is perfect to um, put in your ears for eardrop for earaches so anyway just a couple tips on that um, these are some of my things I have going in here this year I have a new uh, I ordered some of these this is called a tree spinach and it is really packed with protein and this is I, I've got him in three different locations to see how they would do this is the happiest of all three he's he's really happy in this place so I may have to move the other ones over here um, I've got some spinach growing uh, on the fence and this is the spinach that we pull from and eat I have a big portion of this in the big garden but that really goes to my animals it's just easier so I have this here um, I've got a lot of my herbs going um, Blueberry, my blackberries were really great this year. Um, I've got some small blackberry bushes coming up. They didn't give me any fruit this year, but they will next year. Um, and then just hodgepodge of herbs, and I've got some beets going in, in that one over there. But I've already pulled what was in this. I had, um, I had cauliflower and kale and broccoli in all of these, and they're pretty much gone I did throw a couple of beans in this and still have a little bit of sage but pretty much that's it on this one so 
uh, this compost pile was actually still being added to last time we videoed, but um, you can see I've covered it now completely with wood chips and it's in its resting stage and all this rain has been wonderful to help it break down and decompose. And you can see a voluntary pumpkin has come up over there. But uh, this will all go into my garden after I'm done with all of my plants this year. And then I will do my layering with the bunny poop and the chicken poop as well as this. And um, all the wood chips, which we have an abundance of piles since the storm this year has given us abundance of trees to cut down. So, and this is a big garden. You can see the cucumber has uh, happily taken over the trellis here and you can see how easy it is to pick my cucumbers. They just hang down and there's no hunting and wondering if you're actually getting them all on the ground or not. And so um, my godson loves to come in here and, and pick them because they're so easy to, to get in here. And I, you can see that the things that were in here this winter um, are all gone as the sun is no longer available for plants in here. This pretty much just becomes a dormant space, but it makes it real easy to have the cucumbers here. So this path is normally really wide, as you can see, but as these things grow, this does encroach upon your walk space, which is why I gave so much room to all this, because I really do like to let my zucchini and things just have their space to roam. Um, these zucchinis have been in various stages. This was my first one in the ground and has already given me about, uh, about eight or nine really good sized zucchinis. In fact, there was uh, a few days I couldn't come out because of the rain and it came out and I had a zucchini. <laughs> it was like that. So my cousin took it. She was very thrilled to, to eat one that big. So, uh, but these zucchinis are still producing for me. This is at the end of its lifespan. I'm trying to baby it along before I do finally pull it all out. This flat kale has been wonderful. It's literally given me produce for about a year and a half. But it is now pretty much spent. What is what's really been its demise is this the snails this year. They've been super bad with all the rain, and uh, not being able to even put DE down because it rains constantly. Uh, it pretty much got eaten alive by it. Um, I've already harvested that row of carrots. I've replanted this row after I harvested it, and I'm going to harvest these two here in the next few weeks. You can see that. The carrots are peaking up nicely, so they're pretty close to being ready to, to harvest. So these will come out in the next few days. And my Swiss chard is pretty much also at the end of its life. Um, I'm only eating the fresh green ones, but my animals still like the older leaves, so I'm going to keep it going until I have depleted all of that. My green beans are here, and they're kind of taking over the world there. And uh, I had some potatoes in here, which I pulled some, but then I've got, these are my experimental potatoes over here that are the ones that came from seed. They have not died off yet, so I'm still waiting to see how this experiment's gonna turn out. I'll let you know. And then my peppers, I've got peppers in several places, but I've got a wide, wide range of peppers in here but they're all hanging out there. I have some baby mullins that have come up and I'm letting them grow right now. I'll transplant them um, when other things start to encroach upon them. And then I've got butternut squash going here. And then this is kind of an interesting experiment this year. It wasn't intentional, it was an accidental one. But I love purple hole peas and I have some going here. But um, my purple hole peas have been, um, in the past, have had a really hard time with the aphids. Um, but my, my spinach, which is the same spinach you saw in the other garden and I've got here, a voluntary spinach came up and grew amongst them. And if you'll notice, the spinach has a purple vine on it. And I think it's, it's kind of tricked out the bugs. Because I don't know, I have had zero bug issues this year. And I'm able to harvest my purple hole peas without any problems. I mean, literally, I don't know if it's really been a benefit or not, but I'll try it again next year and see. 
but my purple holes are pr producing pretty well. This is where I threw those seeds in when my mama oregano died. You can see I've got a few sunflowers. They have just been beat to death by the rain though, <laughs> and the slugs. My tomatillas have been producing like crazy. I am harvesting so many tomatillas every day, which is fabulous. My, my family loves the tomatilla sauce. Um, I've got about 30 in the house now that I need to do sauce with today, but I can probably pick another 10 today. Um, but they are, they are very happy here. And then you can see my tomatoes, which are now well over five feet, six feet tall now. Um, and I'm a, I'm a real trimmer. I like to come in and pull out anything that's dead or that is of no real value to the plant so that the energy goes to the fruit. And so um, that's why you end up with the empty stalks. But the fruit ends up, in my opinion, much happier and healthier and, and has less issue with disease. Um, and so uh, you can see, wow, well, we've got one here that looks like something got to. But, you know, my, my ratio of losing tomatoes this year has been much lower. So um, I'm, I'm happy with that. With the, I think part of that is due to the, the drip irrigation, although we've had so much rain it's been really hard to know. How beneficial the drip irrigation was because the tomatoes are still getting so much rain. And then I have these peppers, and this is a new pepper. It's a Carmen Italian pepper. It's a sweet pepper, and this thing gets mammoth, and they're they're super sweet and wonderful. I stuff them and then bake them, and they're so good. And then my. Uh, um, Drawing a blank. Hello. Jicama. Thank you. <laughs> My jicama is doing really well. This is a, the life uh, between seeding and harvesting is like 150 days. So it's a very long cycle. So I will harvest these when all the vines die, which is usually October-ish. But, um, but I've got jicama going there. So that'll be nice. And then I've got my melons going here. Watermelons, and you can see some of my big watermelons in the field over there. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. And then uh, this was supposed to all be cantaloupe, and I definitely have some cantaloupe in here, because you can see some in here. But then somehow there has been a squash sneak its way in here. And I've got some squash. They decided to inhabit this space. These are some second planting of cantaloupes just to kind of stagger it because those will will die out probably before I'm ready for them to quit. So these guys will take over. This is where I had my onions. And so after I harvested my onions, I just planted some of those. So that's the, that's the big garden. Well, I just want to say thank you for taking this tour of my gardens with me over the past few months. And I really appreciate you uh, tuning in to watch this. I hope you decide to try some of this Back to Eden garden style. Um, I have found it to be an incredible way to grow just about anything I wanted to put into it with very little effort. So, happy gardening! <laughs>